Gentlemen, I will fight against the stone wall of twice two is four. Welcome, my mere mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information within, to extract some themes you might not have realized, and to also talk about nihilism and rationality. Indeed, we do have Notes from Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky and The Double, although I will only be focusing exclusively on Notes from Underground in this particular book review. This book was published in 1864, and it's about 115 pages in length. It will probably take you two to three hours in total to get through. It is the semi-insane ramblings of an unnamed narrator in St. Petersburg, Russia, during the 19th century. It consists of two parts, the first being the underground and the second being apropos of the wet snow, each of these which has about 10 chapters in it. The first is a rather bitter monologue addressed against society as a whole. Gentlemen, he is writing to people, but is in this monologue rambling sort of form. The second is much more about his actual events earlier in his life as a civil servant and some interactions he has had with old high school friends or old school friends and with a prostitute. As typical of Russian books, it is a lot about reason, about logic, about suffering, about the cold, about morality. It's the classic kind of Russian and Dostoevsky themes that you'll find within here. Which, speaking of the author, Fyodor Dostoevsky, he was born in 1821 and died in 1881. And this book was published originally in Russian, and the translation I have is by Ronald Wilkes. Now, we've reviewed a couple of his books before on this channel, the first being The Idiot and the second being Crime and Punishment, although I should actually say they were the opposite ways around. This was written relatively early after his exile to Siberia, so it's kind of one of his earliest, more popular, noteworthy books. And apparently it has a fair bit of kind of political talkings about or relation to what was going on in Russia at the time, although I don't particularly see it when I was reading it. So let's get into the first theme, which is nihilism. Why do anything? Why do anything? I'm going to focus mainly on the first uh, part of this, this being the underground, but we'll reference, uh, I suppose, the the second part here um, because it is somewhat revealing of the character of this of this unnamed man who is known as the the underground man. And he's rather bitter but active in the in the first part. So this is when he's in his mid-20s. I think he says he's 24 years old. And we see him trying to do some things in the world. He tries to re- reconcile with these old uh, school friends who he actually hated at the time. He still hates, but he kind of goes out because he, he, he wants to meet them anyway. Um, and this ends up in a disastrous dinner where he ends up insulting them, tries to find them again. It's, it's just a chaotic shambles. The second part is where he meets, uh, as he's trying to meet up with them, he meets this prostitute, Lisa. He you know, has sex with her, and then he kind of has this tirade about, about her life, about how she's going to end up and how he's going to be kind of going to be the savior of her if, she, if she'll let him into her life. And then, uh, once again, turns into chaotic shambles when she goes to his house and realizes, oh, he's just a bitter, angry, old, uh, well, not even old at the time, just a bitter, angry man. And one of the things I think you can see with him in his core, he doesn't want to change. He is, no matter when he's trying to do these things, he he, he doesn't have this, uh, I suppose, willpower that's behind it. And we see later that he is lazy, he's bored, he's envious. And I'm going to jump onto page 16 where he can tell you this in his own words. His own words. But I suffer all the same and in an authentic, genuine fashion. I'm jealous. I lose all control over myself. And it all stems from boredom, gentlemen, from sheer boredom. I am crushed by inertia. After all, the immediate, legitimate, direct fruit of consciousness is inertia. That is, consciously sitting, twiddling your thumbs. I've mentioned this before. I repeat, I repeat most emphatically. All spontaneous people and men of action are active because they are dull-witted and limited. 
What is the explanation for this? Well, it's like this. As a result of their limitations, they take immediate and secondary causes for primary ones and are thus persuaded more quickly and easily than others that they have found an indisputable basis for whatever they do and so they are reassured. And that's the main thing. And then he continues on and on about how people are dumb and how it is in this acting that they are actually revealing that their they're stupidness, their crassness, their... Uh, Un, you know, he kind of uses his intelligence as a justification for not doing anything because if you really think about things deeply enough, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't take vengeance on another man because you think it is right because you would be questioning, is this actually the right thing to do? Should I be doing this? And so you can see he's, a, he's very intelligent. There's no doubt about it. But he's also kind of got himself into this state where he's using his intelligence as a crutch. And it's this really odd scenario because he's amazing at creating counter arguments against his own position. And so we see in his kind of insane ramblings in this first part, he'll, he'll say something, then he'll, then he'll be like, Oh, but gentlemen, I, I know that you're going to say this, but then he'll kind of counter argument. And there's, there's this back and forth that keeps going on. What I would use as an analogy for him is somewhat like a parachuter who's got stuck in a tree. And so there's this, you know, parachutists, they're, they're stuck in the tree, the, uh, you know, parachute cords are all t uh, twindled up, they're, they're riddled, they, he can't get out of it, but he can kind of swing and try and reach for a branch. And he kind of sees other parachutists also doing this. And, you know, he attempts it a couple of times himself, but he somewhat fails. And so he ends up just being content with this position where he's, you know, hanging from the tree. And sure, he can look down on everyone and he's rather intelligent and he can see the world and he can kind of, you know, look at the machinations of men on the ground and he can have this bird's eye view and, and feel like he's morally superior. But he, he plays no part in it. He's just sat up and alone, cold with the wind, bitter and angry against everyone. And I think this is what happens when you have time and intellect. When you've just got nothing to kind of focus or channel that that intellect through, you can end up ending in this nihilism and it's somewhat of a choice because he kind of chooses to be in here. Um, and, but then he also has this attacks on rationality, on determinism. And it's, it's almost like the bitterness and the anger and whatnot just comes from him not being able to actually act in the world to get what he wants because he has a couple of attempts at it, but they kind of fail. He doesn't get what he wants. And so, he then uses this great intellect of his to, to kind of condemn the world and, and talk shit about it, which gets us onto our second theme here, which is irrational rationality, the outcome of trying to fight nature's laws. And the starting point that we see is, is him basically in the irrationality zone. He's, he's irrational. So he's ranting and he's off his rocker. Uh, he's writing these imaginary notes to gentlemen, gentlemen, I, I, you know, I hold you to this thing, blah, blah, blah. And the funny thing is he admits he's never going to send these to anyone. He's never actually going to publish them to society. He's insane, but he's also smart at the same time. And the question is kind of how did he get here? Part of this you'd probably say is baked in just from the little backstory that we know of him. He was an orphan, so he probably had a pretty rough childhood. He was relatively ostracized for his smarts in, in school. And so when he was in school, he kind of couldn't connect with other kids and he was already being put up on this pedestal, but he never actually did anything with it. It's like, oh, the underground man, you know, he's going to he's gonna go places, he's really smart. And, and, and what we actually see is, no, he, he kind of just becomes this middling civil servant. He ends up getting a bit of money, so he doesn't even need to do that and just isolates himself and in this room with uh, this manservant that he hates and who, you know, it's this kind of back and forth of, of envy, of disgust and anger. And you, he's just in this bitter, bitter shell. But he's kind of also fighting against nature's laws. And so we see here on page 12 where he first brings up the concept of twice two is four, which I mentioned right at the beginning. So he's talking uh, about the, I suppose, the demonstration of, of things that are immutable that can't be changed. And he says, uh, since twice two is mathematics, just you try and refute it. If you don't mind, they'll shout at you. You can't fight it. This is twice two is four. 
Nature doesn't ask for your permission. She's not concerned about your wishes or whether or not you care for her laws. You are obliged to accept her as she is and consequently all her end results. That is, a wall is a wall, etc., etc. Good heavens, what do the laws of nature and arithmetic have to do with me if, for some reason, I don't happen to like those laws and that twice two is four? Naturally, I shan't break through that wall with my forehead if, in fact, I don't have the strength. But I won't capitulate simply because I'm confronted with a stone wall and don't have the strength to break through. So we see he's kind of got this concept of, of there, there are these immutable laws. There are these things that can't be changed. And... Instead of accepting them, he's, he somewhat tries to fight them. And in that example I gave just there, you know, he, he's kind of a little bit rational about it. But when we jump a little bit later onto page 31, we come to this. Twice two is four is nevertheless an intolerable thing. Twice two is four is, in my opinion, nothing more than a damn cheek. Twice two is four looks on smugly, hands on hips, stands on your path and defies you. I agree that twice two is four is an excellent thing, but if we're going to praise everything, then twice two is five can sometimes be a most charming little thing as well. And he brings up this analogy of why it's intolerable. And he's basically saying that as compared to ants who, even though they have to do the process of building an ant hill, their end goal is what they want. They actually want the end goal, which in this case is kind of the nature's law, twice two is four, this immutable thing. And what he says is like, no, it's intolerable because we're not ants, because we are these human creatures who most of what we enjoy, the, the pleasure, the meaning we get out is in the, the process of doing it. It is, it is the construction of the anthill, not the final finished result. And so he goes on a kind of big rant about this. Once again, he's, he's using as, as a rash, rationality. There's definitely rationality. But we kind of see that the underground man is is a character, and he's 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 this he's more of a, a personification of a an idea of of trying to deal with paradox is is how I would probably describe it. The the result of of dealing with the paradoxical nature of life, and he does it in this way where he has rational rationality, but he's kind of irrational in his use of it, and he. he it's kind of a way of dealing with life poorly. And I think it can embitter you and, and make you nihilistic, which is now jumping on to my own observations and takeaways. And you say, well, Kyron, how is he actually irrational? Well, <laughs> there's a good demonstration here on page 97 where he's basically caused this whole scenario. He's insulted these old high school friends. He's burnt bridges. He's just behaved like a total asshole. And, uh, he, he arrives home. So he goes, the moment I arrived home, I wrote to Simonov. To this day, I am lost in admiration when I recall the truly gentlemanly, genial and frank tone of my letter. Deftly, no, uh, nobly, and most importantly, without one superfluous word, I had blamed myself for everything. I excused myself, if I may still be permitted to excuse myself. By the fact that being completely unused to drink, the very first glass I had allegedly drunk before they arrived, while I was waiting for them in Hotel de Paris from five to six o'clock had gone to my head. I apologized chiefly to Simonov and I asked him to convey my apologies to all the others, especially to Zerkov or Zverkov, whom I vaguely remembered having insulted. I added that I would have called on them or on all of them personally, but that my head was splitting and most of all, I was deeply ashamed. I was particularly pleased with a certain lightness of touch, even verging on the casual, perfectly polite, however, which suddenly found expression through my pen and which gave them at once to understand better that any possible argument that I took a rather detached view of that beastly affair of yesterday. And he goes on and on talking about how, isn't there even a touch of Marquis-like playfulness here? And admiring his letter, how intellectually mature and educated a person he is, <laughs> he is absolutely utterly delusional if he thinks that just by writing a letter, he can uh, erase not only years of resentment, but a very recent, you know, insulting, unpleasant experience for a whole bunch of people. He he has, when, when you look at this character, I personally feel this kind of mix of sympathy yet criticism for his choices. He, he definitely deserves some sympathy because there's no way that you can get to this state without having some innate, <laughs> innate problems which, which are just magnified, yet he does still, still seem to have made enough choices. He does seem irrational enough that he could have worked his way out of this. And 
I have this concept, which I have been using for a long time, which uh, I call making myself dumb, which is when I start to overthink things, when I get into a state where I do find myself becoming bitter and angry and resentful, it's usually because I'm, I'm trying to think my way out of a problem instead of acting and fixing the problem or you know, taking a more perhaps scientific approach and doing different tests to see if I can figure this problem. For me, this used to be being able to talk with women and kind of interacting with society at large. I had a lot of anxiety. And what we see is that he he refuses to do this. There is a part in this where he explicitly refuses, like, I will not make myself dumb. I will not bow down. I will not uh, disregard my intellect uh, and just just to kind of fit in, just to make myself hard appear, just because it is more practical. You know, I will stand true to my intellect, which is just this ridiculous kind of position. It's not like he worked on his intellect to get it. He just naturally had it. And yet he refuses to kind of let go of the things that are, are making him unhappy, that are causing bad things to happen in his, in his life, to cause him suffering. And, and he just holds on to it. And this is the point where you, you start to say, okay, well, this is as close as you can get to free will and rational choice as possible. He just refuses to, to do that. He, he, he doesn't make the right choice. He makes the wrong one. And for me, I think this is where it should be rational irrationality. He's got it the wrong way around. So instead of being irrational rationality, which is having this underlying base of rationality, which is the core firm belief of your life, I will be rational under all circumstances, which kind of leads to this irrational use of it where he thinks that he can magically make up with these people, where he thinks that taking no action and nihilism is the is the way to go in life and causes just absolutely negative outcomes, both for him and for anyone who interacts with him. He should have something more of rational irrationality, except that life is is ridiculous, except that things aren't going to go your way, except that things, some things can't be changed and that there's no use fighting against them and that they, those things themselves might seem paradoxical and then add a level of rationality on top of that, i.e. being rational, having rational irrationality. I know I'm kind of confusing the terms here, but that I think that's the way to, to kind of approach more life, you know, being rational and going, okay, I'm going to have to be irrational to kind of fit in with the world. That's, that's kind of what's needed. I can't use my intellect in all circumstances to solve things. Sometimes you actually need to do things and to do things which seem dumb. So it's one of those times where you, you look at a character and you just go, man, you, you've, you've got the, the essentials of what could be used for a good life, but you've just used it horribly and you've kind of focused on the wrong thing. And uh, just for me personally, I look at characters who use intelligence in the way that this uh, unnamed narrator does, and I just go, "Man, your 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 pride, your arrogance is is leading you down a bad path because you just can't accept that intellect isn't everything. Sometimes action is, sometimes acceptances of irrationality and things like this." Which gets on to the final observation: was two plus two, or twice two, is four. Or is it five? And this is just a common recurring theme. It, uh, you never see one and three as four being used to kind of make this rational argument or or one, one plus one is two. It's really funny because this has occurred in this you know, rather famous book. It's occurred in my favorite book of all time, 1984, where it pays, plays a large part. There must be something about two and two equaling four or equaling five, which maybe it's just due to the number of fingers on our hands. Maybe it's due to, I, I honestly have no idea, but it, it seems to be a, a recurring theme because it it does pop up in these kind of very well-known books and and used as this logical, mm, the, the, you know, almost the base of logic. You can't get any more basic in logic of two and two is four or twice two is four. Or can it be five? Who knows? <laughs> it's just uh, something about it captures the imagination, which I think is very cool. So in summary, uh, it takes time for this to sink in. My first reading of this, I was rather meh, uh, both about the initial part one and then especially part two. I, I definitely wasn't that 
keen into it and it was more in the research afterwards and constructing my notes where I was a bit more appreciative uh, of the notes from underground, my notes of notes. Uh, the underground man, I think, is a rather sad blend of nihilism, of being angry, of, of pity, of also having some insight. He definitely wasn't an idiot and he showcased some things that I'm sure were about Russian uh, culture at the time, about the philosophy at the time as well. And, and it probably is does need a bit more historical context to put in everything about why this book was rather impactful at the time. Uh, he's not a person to be emulated, but he was certainly identifiable, at least to me. I saw parts of myself in him and I just go, you know, ultimately he wasn't that smart. Otherwise he would have made the smart decision to kind of lose a bit of his intellect. Uh, so my personal reading of it, my personal enjoyment just of this one, I'm going to give Notes from Underground a 6 out of 10. It was okay. Uh, I would focus more on part one, to be honest. I think that's where the meat of it is. And it's maybe something I'll come back to in the future. And if I have a bit more psychological or psychology desire and really examine it, because I can't, it's not that I skipped through, but I also didn't really enjoy the, the, the meat perhaps that is in uh, a large portion of this. And maybe that does require learning a bit more about Russian culture and history and philosophy at, at the time in the 19th century. So that is it for today, my mere modelites. Thank you for joining me underground here. What are your thoughts on notes from underground on Fyodor Dostoyevsky on nihilism on rational irrationality or irrational rationality? I would love to know all of these things. Did any of what I say <laughs> made sense? <laughs> the best way to do that is by leaving a comment here on YouTube, like, subscribe, do all of those things. And then I'd also recommend checking out the Mere Mortals podcast. That is where I take a lot of the ideas that I find in these books and I use them in a more conversational style so you can see how this book will affect me in my life or affect my thinking or has changed me in certain ways or not. So I would just recommend checking out that. All of this is available in audio form as well. So if you are ever wanting to use a podcast app, just type in Mere Models Book Reviews and bam, the audio will show up. I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the underground and you're not being too nihilistic and not using your intellect as justification for doing nothing. Ciao for now. Kyron, out.